Well, while Bill's uh, setting up, it's, we're having a great time. It's wonderful to be here. And um, it's partic yesterday was particularly delightful. Uh, for 25 of the last 31 years we lived in Norman, Oklahoma, we lived three blocks from the OU Stadium. And it was so nice being on a game day Saturday without 85,000 frenzied fans uh, in our neighborhood. So it was delightful and quiet and we enjoyed it so greatly. Um, I want to talk about something that's really exciting and that is uh, Casas Grandes or Paki May. Uh, <coughs> the peso and the traditional word for the site was Casas Grandes. The Mexicans seem to want to continue to use or increase the use of the word Paki May and that's okay. Uh, it's an absolutely fantastic area. Uh, it is south of the, the border in the other southwest. And that border as Bill alluded to, makes a profound difference in the history of archaeology in several ways. One is there are communication differences, uh, but there, it's also a, it's a, an area that is between two of the most uh, intensively studied regions in the world, uh, Mesoamerica. I mean, who hasn't been excited by the Maya or the Aztec or the Olmec or the Zapotec? <clears throat> and uh, the Mexicans are as, as well incredibly excited in that area. So archaeology in Mexico, and archaeology is so important to a Mexican identity, has concentrated on Mesoamerica. Up until recently, most Mexicans felt about Chihuahua and Casas Grandes area as most people in the United States think about oh, Fargo, North Dakota. <laughs> it's there, it's a part of us, but it's not a place that we particularly want to be. Anybody from Fargo here? <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> there is, as you know, an incredible amount of archaeology north of the border. There are literally hundreds of archaeologists, incredible amount of money uh, being spent. But it doesn't go south into northwest Mexico. So it has traditionally been a no man's land. When in 1984, when I went down to the regional office of the Mexican governmental agency uh, responsible for archaeology, I met with the single archaeologist in the entire state of Chihuahua, which is about 85% of the size of Arizona. So just think if there was one archaeologist in the state of Arizona, and that's where Chihuahua was. The projects that Mike Whalen, uh, my colleague at the University of Tulsa and I, began in 1989 was the first large project, and it wasn't that large, uh, since uh, De Peso left in about uh, 1961. And so there's a profound difference in the history, the amount of work and the communication between the two areas. One thing I will say, there are some advantages. South of the border is far more cosmopolitan. Name me a project director of the hundreds of archaeologists north of the border who isn't a U.S. citizen. Almost nobody. Of the five archaeology projects that have been ongoing in Chihuahua, the directors are from three countries. So there are some advantages. But there are profound differences. And in fact, the word Southwest is such a geographic-centric term that just drives the Mexicans crazy because, in fact, it's the Northwest. <laughs> what's north of the border and what's south of the border are connected, and yet we refer to it as the Southwest, when really, historically, it's the Northwest. Of course, if we talked about the whole common Northwest archaeology, uh, that would confuse everybody else. And so there's a term that I will try to use that Randy McGuire came up with called the Northwest South, uh, South, uh, Southwest Northwest, which I think is a, is a fair uh, term because actually a large amount, maybe even half <coughs> of the Southwest Northwest is in Mexico, centered on the international four corners. Well, almost. They don't quite come together, but it's close enough. Uh, fortunately, in the last 15 years, there has been, an, uh, not an explosion, but there's been an increase in archaeological research. Uh, there are five investigators in Chihuahua, probably about the same number as Sonora. So, you know, from one to five, that's a, a big plus. But the amount of work that gets done is, is so much less, and, and there's things and issues that were settled in, uh, archaeological questions that were settled uh, 30 years ago that still are being investigated, things of basic chronology and such. So it's a very, very different kind of place to work, but it's a very delightful place to work because the people love it. Archaeology, the ancient peoples are an integral part of the identity of Mexicans. And the people in northern Mexico who feel left out from central Mexico and that kind of place uh, 
cleave to Paki Mei as their part of their ancient heritage. And if you're interested in it, they're more than happy to help you. Out of the 25 years we've done field work, we maybe had two people that were not terribly friendly and would bend over backwards to help us. So it's really much appreciated and greatly loved. The place is a very nice place. We think of northern Mexico as stinking desert. You've seen the dunes outside Juarez and everything. But I would argue that it is one of the key wonderful places for prehistoric people, particularly prehistoric farmers. It's a verdant landscape where the desert plains, the foothills, and the continental Sierra Madres come together. So there is a, a range of resources, and the farming can be spectacular. Paquime, the Rio Casas Grandes Valley, draws from three major tributaries with a huge catchment in the Sierra Madres. And so they have a dependable and fertile, they have a dependable water supply, an adequate water supply. It's a very wonderful place for farmers. I was at a seminar last fall when they're trying to argue that Chaco Canyon was a really nice place to farm. <laughs> <coughs> and they haven't convinced me yet as much as they're trying. Uh, this place is, I think, an incredible draw for prehistoric peoples, and it isn't recognized because there's been so little research. As a hint of that, let's take a detour 3,000 years before Pakime, which is at about A.D. 1200, to a place called Cerro Huanacania, just north of Pakime, near a place called Hanos, which is historically interesting. And there's this hill, and you can see there's a fortified village with terraces. These are handmade terraces, and as, maybe you can't see it well here, but those are the terraces. This dates to 1700 BC, to the late archaic. These people are farming, having a farming village really early. That and the work that's being done in Tucson, like at Las Capas, has really changed their idea of the archaic. And I think Cerro Huanacania, this incredible village, 3,000 years before Pakime, may be a clue, an archaeological indicator, that we're dealing with a particularly verdant, wonderful place, one of the centers of population in the southwest, northwest that hasn't been recognized because there's been so little research done. Let's skip 3,000 years <laughs> and we'll go to Pakime. And you can't talk about Pakime without the contributions of the Ameren Foundation um, that did a project, a world-class, incredibly large project. They did field work from 1959 to 1961 the Pace, Charles de Peso, who was the archaeologist, whoop, sorry, right there. And his crew then spent over a decade in Dragoon doing a study and writing up, and there's an eight volume, eight volume set, which is, I think, one of the classics in southwestern archaeology, southwest northwest archaeology. And the project really was at a scale that I think only was matched by Howry's snake pound work at the time. It was an incredible project. The Peso tells the story that he had done a project and was getting kind of tired. And he wanted to go to visit sort of family homeland in, um, in Italy. And he was talking to the founders, the Fulton family, the founders and patrons of the Ameren Foundation. And he said, and I think uh, the, uh, William Shirley uh, Fulton said, well, what do we do next, Charlie? And he decided, well, he would come up with the most audacious, insane, labor-intensive project he could think of, Fulton would say, oh, we can't do that. And then Charlie could go off to Italy. <laughs> and you know what he said. I don't know if it's true, but it's a really a wonderful story. <laughs> By the way, this is for the Ameren table. We got this picture, and there's the Fulton family, and that's Ernie. Anybody have a clue who Ernie is? Does anybody recognize Ernie? Do you know anybody? Okay, well, good, because in a poster I cut him out. <laughs> So if you're related to Ernie, I apologize. <laughs> we just didn't know who he was. Okay, it was an amazing project in terms of its scale, but also the international collaboration. The Ameren Foundation took the lead in money and excavations, and the peso was in charge. The peso was in charge of excavation. Eduardo Contreras was the INA representative. He was in charge of mapping and restoration. He is so beloved because he's one of the early Mexican archaeologists who cared about the no uh, North that the library in the big town nearby is named after him. And he was granted permission to be buried, or his family was granted permission for him to be buried 
at Casas Grandes. So the cremated remains of Contreras are in a Ramos polychrome vessel, not, you know, a re a, uh, not an original one, a replica, and then buried in that pyramid at Paquimé that's only reserved for really the most important archaeologists because uh, Mexican government tends to not do that very much. So it was a collaborative effort. It was not only huge, but it was a collaboration between Mexico and the Ameren Foundation. It was absolutely spectacular, and what they found was amazing. The first European explorers who visited Paquimé in late 1500s were tromping up, the Ibarra expedition were tromping up through northern Mexico, and their eyes were glazed by being in the middle of nowhere. And they came across the Casas Grandes Valley and Belsavar, the, the Obregón, the chronicler for the Ibarra expedition, said, this is an amazing, the most wonderful valley. And he describes Paquimé. It's probably the first archaeological site ever recorded in the historic record. And from that time, it was noted by Obregón until De Peso worked there. Everybody said, gee, this is really interesting. But nobody did anything for 500 years. And when the joint Casas Grandes project excavated Paquimé, they found just amazing stuff. The volumes are spectacular. So, uh, yeah? Do you know who the two guys are in the right-hand shot? Uh, is one of those? Um, one of it could be. I'll ha we'll have to ask him. He's down. Who's, who's the guy on the right? I don't know. We've been a lot of photographs, and we haven't been able to figure out. I, I don't know. We we could. It, you know, if I, if you make a copy of that photograph, I've got to take some artifacts down to Casas this Does fall. Else know? <laughs> <laughs> don't you know anything? No. <laughs> All right. I don't know who that is, but that room is a room that had almost a ton and a half of shell artifacts. 50 Gila polycomb vessels stacked in one corner. All, most of the raw mineral materials found at Pakime were found in that room. It was a storehouse of just inc incredible. In fact, you can see the shell just being collected. The tomb of very special burials of probably the ancestors of the leaders of Pakime in a tomb. The walk-in well, boy, Oshi would not like that if that was in the US. <laughs> a shrine that went down to the water table, mound of the cross, unbelievable material that had to be written up. And then De Peso had his unique interpretive framework. And here is a diagram that's you, too small for you to read. But he not only excavated it, but he interpreted it in a very novel way. Tend not to agree with it, but you know, he's a scientist. He put this stuff out, and you put it out so people can disagree. Though, needless to say, they can't disagree with anything Mike and I do. Uh, anyway, this was an amazing project at a scale that, besides Howry's <coughs> Snake Town, was unmatched until you got large contract programs uh, starting 20, 30 years ago in the Southwest. An amazing project. And what did they find? So I just want to talk a little bit, if you've never been there, uh, about some of the neat stuff at Pakime, and then uh, the kind of work that we're doing, which is not nearly as impressive, and uh, a few lessons we can learn from Pakime. Anyway, this is an H. L. Heise aerial photography of Pakime, and it's absolutely impressive. This is what Obregón and those people saw, these big, hunking mounds of dirt, which were adobe room blocks, multiple stories tall, probably about up to, up to three stories tall, most weren't, of uh, these uh, massive walls, incredible structure. The peso started, basically, on the west and worked east, and there are reasons to do that. Excavated number of room blocks, and then a whole series of, which I'll talk about in a minute, this public ritual architecture that is absolutely amazing. By the way, if you want to visit, and I would recommend it, it's a fairly safe place to visit, Ina has built this really spectacular museum. The director of the Park Service went down once on a tour, and he said that's the second best small museum that he, the museology is the second best he's ever seen, and it's a really a neat place. Plus, you have the colonial town of Casas Grandes. An amazing excavation. And so what do we have? First and foremost, despite all the cool stuff, that's the technical term, uh, <laughs> it's a domestic community. The peso estimated, you know, maybe 5,000 people living there. I think a more, uh, my colleague thinks it's closer to 2,000, but that's a big community. About 1,000 rooms, maybe two, or maybe 1,000. Uh, that's the range. And the architecture is spectacularly thick and large. Those are huge rooms, really well made. The beat. The beams coming from the Sierra Madres, being brought down from the Sierra Madres, not unlike Chaco, not at that scale, 
uh, but huge beams. Uh, rammed earth, producing these multi-storied room blocks. And the aerial view shows you that these people weren't those boring ancestral Pueblo people, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> These people were interesting architects. <laughs> Look at that. That room, I believe, has 17 walls. <laughs> I once excavated a room like that. It was not fun. <laughs> um, it is an amazing. Now, a more typical kind of room would be uh, one like this. It's L-shaped, probably a living area and a storage or sleeping area. But these, there are plazas, room blocks, ceremonial rooms, and God knows what that is. But it's pretty cool architecture. It's a massive and impressive architecture of power that we've called it. So first and foremost, despite all the cool stuff, the neat stuff, the impressive stuff you see at Pakime, this was a living community, a vibrant living community, and one of the largest ones in the southwest, northwest. Public ritual, ritual architecture. Clearly, there were a lot of things. This was a center of whatever held the the Casas Grandes group peoples together. And there are hundreds of communities in the surrounding area. They had public events and ritual events. And one of the material indicators of that is this public ritual architecture, which is in abundance at Pakime. Uh, Bill, that's what a ball court's supposed to look like. <laughs> that's a real Mesoamerican I-shaped ball court. There are two huge ones there, and there may be a third. Uh, there are platform mounds. That tomb that where those pots were found with the cremated remains of the people were in there. Mound of the cross that marks the uh, celestial events. And then doing ethnobotany as well as archaeology, these are my favorite. That's a roasting pit. <laughs> there are five of them. This is probably the largest roasting pit in the southwest, northwest. We estimate that they could have cooked about 7,000 pounds of agave at any one setting. This is not a weekend Weber grill. <laughs> this is the feed Lots of people coming in for these important events. Not, and what's also interesting is each mound is different. They don't look alike. There's the mound of the bird that looks like a bird with its head chopped off. There is, and I didn't notice this until about my third trip to Pakime, there is a 60 foot long uh, feathered serpent mound off to the side. And so none of the mounds are exactly the same. There's a lot of diversity. That probably tells you something about the, the political structure and the kinds of things that went on there. So there's a lot of ritual architecture. 15 platform mounds, depending on what you want to call a platform mound, two huge ball courts, maybe another small one, and five of these monstrous ovens, including probably the largest oven uh, in the northwest, southwest. Pretty cool stuff. OK. Neat artifacts. Again, being too technical. Am I being too technical, Hill? OK. <laughs> Turquoise. Oh, I knew how to use this. Turquoise. There's turquoise there. It's not all that impressive. Let's get copper from West Mexico. All kinds of spectacular copper. That, which was used to raise those. Those are macaw pens. Now, if you went to any of my, my wife's talk last week, uh, she was all excited about 21 macaws at um, Membrace. There are hundreds of them at Pocky May. Okay? These, this was a center of production of macaws. Uh, these stones. Right there, the round donut stones and the pestle-like things are the entrance stones. Uh, they found in the Pesos excavation 125 of these things. So, and and that, I'm not saying that they're all ma uh, uh, nesting boxes for macaws, but there was a huge production. They figured out how to keep these tropical birds alive in the crappy, cold northern Chihuahuan desert. I mean, that was quite a trick. They probably got rich. Uh, they used the birds in sacrifices for dedicatory offerings and such, and they also probably traded the feathers. Obviously, we can't see the, the feather trade well, but there was a cave in Utah, I think in the 1930s, somebody was uh, looking around and behind a rock, they found a rabbit cloak with 2,000 macaw feathers on it, which may give you some kind of indication. Boy, that person was probably P.O. that uh, forgot about it. <laughs> which cave did I leave that cloak in? Um, <laughs> But it gives you maybe a hint about uh, the trade in macaw feathers that we really can't see because they degrade so easily. Anyway, this is spectacular. So, ton and a half of shell, three pickup truck loads of shell. If you go to Casas, they're in these columns. And they're, they're now in plexiglass because they were in glass and some kid ran into one one. They spilled all over the floor, so they made it out of plexiglass. Unbelievable amount of material. 
Now, what they are, people have argued, uh, whether they're trade or whether they're offerings. I think they're probably offerings because of the kind of the junkiest uh, shell. But nonetheless, incredible quantities. This is what gets attention. That's what impresses people. Now, as somebody who studies plant remains an archaeological site, clearly, I like boring stuff, the less, ex uh, less impressive stuff. But one thing you have to do in archaeology, especially in a place like Pakime, is not just look at the neat stuff, but look at the whole range. Now, if you have a, a lithic scatter, that's not a problem. Uh, but here, you have all kinds of artifacts that help tell incredibly interesting things about Pakime, the story of their lives, um, that aren't visually exciting. So, what is the artifact category that gets the least attention and respect among archaeologists? Ground stone. <laughs> Matades. They're good for making walls, right? <laughs> I was at giving a talk in Virginia, and a friend Steve Plogg, who some of you maybe read his book, this is the slide that impressed him. Those are incredible ground stone. They're called Type 1A1 Matates, incredibly well made. There's probably even a production warehouse where they made a uh, workshop where they made these things. And they're ground stone, but they're so well made. And this is maybe analogous to uh, the kind of China, your Aunt Cora's China that you only bring out for uh, you know, Thanksgiving or Christmas dinners. These were may have been only been used to prepare special things for special meals. But that's the ground stone is pretty spectacular. What are those things? Those are turkey pens. Okay, those are where turkeys were raised. And you go, well, you know, macaws, turkeys. Macaws are beautiful. Turkeys are, they're turkeys. <laughs> you know? And you ignore them except none of the turkeys were eaten. They were, turkeys had their heads cut off and sacrificed. They were offerings. Not only that, but the distribution of turkeys suggested it was controlled maybe by a small group of people, more than even macaws. And so we would dismiss turkeys because they aren't cool. On the other hand, if we get beyond what's cool and interesting looking and we look at the distribution of the archaeological evidence, and turkeys are pretty interesting. There, there are as many turkeys as there are macaws. There are as many, probably as many turkey pens as there are macaw pens. And they were used in similar ways. And again, they're not pretty, but they tell us about how people live. And then there are sites in the outlying area. You're not going to drive down to Pakime to see that. <laughs> uh, that is a community, probably a 10-room adobe pueblo where a family or two live for we don't know how long, living their daily lives, farming, gathering, hunting, maybe going into Pakime once or twice a year, maybe once or twice a decade, who knows, for these important events. Uh, but these are the, uh, these are the 99 percent. These are the people that are most of the people at Pakime. And they are, their lives are as important. That's where we have been looking at survey, looking at the distribution of these communities, these sites. As boring as they may look like, they tell us about a regional perspective on how the people live. And then to really bore you, there's that. Which is in fact in here. It's the first prehistoric chili seed, cultivated chili seed ever found in the southwest and northwest. We think of Southwest cuisine, and you can come up and look at it, it's broken. Uh, fortunately, I found some other ones. Uh, you think of Southwestern cuisine, you know, as having chilies, but they came in with the Spanish, basically. As far as we can tell, the cuisines of the ancient Southwest Northwest were fairly bland, maize-based. There are various wild plants that would have added um, uh, spice, and you don't find those, for example, in prehistoric feces from the uh, four corners. And so the Spanish really changed things a lot. And so one of the questions have always been, you know, where are the chilies? They can grow in the Southwest perfectly well. Why didn't they come up with all those other Mesoamerican foods like corn, beans, squash, amaranth, cotton, that, that became the, the core uh, foods of the prehistoric peoples? And one argument was they were never here, but that chili seed proves they were here. So uh, I, I tell you, uh, as an archaeologist, one of our biggest problems is people ask, well, what's the neatest thing you found? And what do you say? Well, I found the distribution of settlement communities. I mean, I can now say, ha-ha, I found the first chili seed right here. Isn't that exciting? OK. So I have my answer, and I don't know what other people have theirs. Anyway, so these things are not that visually impressive. They would be, <coughs> they would not be noticed, but they are really important parts of understanding the entire society and how these people live. 
So what Mike and I did when we were going to start working in 1989, you know, the pace of excavated a lot of pocumane, uh, and we could, we could go back. There are lots of questions to be asked and use new techniques. Uh, but what was really missing was a regional view. This was a center, but a center is not in isolation. There are other communities around it. And the Pesa was so busy working at X, you can imagine how time consuming and incredible it was to concentrate on Pocky May that he wasn't able to do a whole lot others. He did some other excavations, he did a little bit of a kind of survey, but not enough, and it's perfectly understandable why. It's not a criticism. So we felt we really needed to understand what was going on. And so we have. Uh, on regional survey, and there's some hints that there's some connections between communities. Casas Grandes is right here, and if you go up to the closest high hill, at the very top is this 35 meter diameter stone uh, structure that's with stones about this high called Cerro Moctezuma, which De Peso thought was a fire communication system, and I think it was. But it's also probably a shrine, and at the base is something called El Pueblito which is unusual kind of architecture, Ar architecture more like Pakime than the architecture of the outlying little communities. It was probably an important ritual center that helped stage events, and there is, I think, I hope, can you see that little wall right there? That just, and there's a gate, and this is Todd Peitzel, who uh, just got his PhD at U of A and is now employed at Arizona State Museum, did the site. And it's this wall here, serves no purpose other than you might, can imagine, coming up from Pakime, seeing this wall and entering through the gate into this very special community. And then continuing up, I don't know if you can see it here, there's a trail, well-worn trail that you can still see today, up to Cerro Moctezuma. That suggests that this fire communication, that there's connections between populations, that there aren't isolated communities, which you would expect that being the center, that Pakime being so large, is at least five times larger than the next largest community, uh, brought people together. And so we wanted to look at, take a regional view. Now there are sites up the mountains. There's Cuarenta Casas, 40 rooms, and there's Cueva de la Hoya, which is so spectacular, that's a granary. Uh, those are both national monuments and you can go visit them. It's 40 miles from Casas Grandes and usually takes three hours, but they put a new road in. Uh, but it's up in a beautiful valley. It's absolutely spectacular. And there are people living up in the mountains. The problem with the mountains for us was uh, the, the logistics of getting around are really difficult. It takes a long time and that would reduce the amount of data you got. And uh, before the drug wars, there was uh, drug activity up in the mountains and we just decided, you know, being chickens, uh, that we would work down in the lowlands. But uh, we go up there all the time, Cueva de la easy to get up to, and it's safe, and it's unbelievable. You walk up, you get off, and you walk up this slick rock, and you see a tree, and the closer you get, you sort of see a vague image of this round thing, and then you get up closer, and there is this huge, this huge granary. It's, it's woven grass with mud around it. Okay, and there are lots of other cliff dwellings and Mexican government is studying these right now and they're opening them up for visitors, okay? Cool stuff. So we did survey in the lower, in the river valleys in particular where most people live and uh, we recorded about 450 sites, about 350 of them date to the same time as Paki May, the, called the Medio period, about 80, 1250, the late 1400s. Um, and here you have our crews lined up walking systematic survey. I think they're waiting for somebody to go to the bathroom. Um, and this is one of the big sites. You can see this is a mound. Partly you can see the mound because they're big, but they're also been looted. You can see other stuff. Ball court. Again, an I-shaped ball court, a real ball court. <laughs> uh, this is called an atalaya. This probably was part of the fire communication system. I had a student who, <laughs> I actually liked the guy, but he walked up 50 hills all summer. And he found the ones that had these were intervisible, statistically more intervisible with Sarah Moctezuma than other hills. And that thing, which is one of those big ovens. And what's that? It's a mock cost stone. So survey's incredibly easy here. And you could learn a lot just looking at uh, sites. Okay. So our first, after doing all that survey, our first, uh, thing we want to do is do some excavation. And on the basis of the survey, we argued, and a, lot, a number of people don't agree with this, that Pocky Bay, while it was big and impressive, only controlled an area, really controlled an area about, 30, about a, a day's walk. That it influenced and was related to people farther away, but its strong control really was very, very small. Big site, small area. A lot of people thought big site, 
empire, but we're arguing differently. And again, it's not something everybody agrees with. And so we took these, maybe I can learn to use this. Um, we did our first phase was to test excavate three sites. You can see Mike and Hive have just this amazing sense of humor in naming sites. There's 204, 317, 231, and 242. Our students just, it's just amazing how, how, how amused they are. But you can see, uh, by other things, here's Pocky May. You can see how the floodplain, how broad and wonderful. You have the Arroyo La Tenaja. You have the Rio uh, Piedras Verdes. The Mormon colonies are right here. Uh, the Rio Palangonis, all coming out of the Sierra Madres, which are right here, joining together at the Hacienda San Diego, which Lumholz overwintered, and then becoming the Casas Grandes. So there was a lot of water, and you can see the farmland was quite uh, uh, abundant right near Pacume, which probably was one of the reasons it became the dominant community. It could build up surpluses because of the good farmland and use those surpluses to build power bases and alliances. I'll just show you a picture of each site. This is, we started with small sites. You just don't do any site. We tried to do sites, each one that was different, to get it so we could do some basic comparison. Uh, this is a uh, site uh, 231, which is a small site. There's a Sierra Madres. Here is um, the sloping foothills, and here's our excavation. And here you can see the mound, what it looks like. This is 317. It's a small mound. There's actually an oven here, and there's another mound here. It's just, these are small sites. That's a silage pit that the, uh, the guy who owned the land bulldozed a silage pit so he could store stuff. Um, so anyway, two small sites. That's where, again, we don't want to look at just the big sites because most people lived at relatively small sites. And then weird sites or special sites, like El Pueblito, this one which we call 242, and it took us forever to find this thing. Um, is a special site. You can't see it well, but here's the largest ball court outside Pacquiame. Here's another view where the foothills of the Sierra Madres. There's a room block of adobe, uh, uh, a mound where the adobe rooms had collapsed, and Mike and I walked and I said, this just doesn't feel right. And when we excavated it, we found that it had uh, rooms that were like Pacquiame. Huge walls. One room had 14 walls. Big, impressive architecture, fan some fancy artifacts, nothing like Pakime. And this is embarrassing, there's a platform mound. Well, here's Mike Whalen at the platform mound. After making fun of Holocom ball courts, I'm sort of embarrassed to say that's a platform mound. <laughs> uh, it's, it is a platform mound. It's not impressive in its physical structure, but it's the only platform mound that we know of of the 350 sites that we've looked at, we found one platform mound outside of Pakime. It happens to be at the same site that has the largest ball court. So that says this is something special. And there are other characteristics about it that uh, we can talk about later. So we got two small sites, the special purpose site of some way. And then we spent three years excavating at one of the two largest sites we knew of outside of Pakime, site 204. There's Cerro Makazuma with Pakime just on the other side. Here's that Atalaya I showed you. This is the Piedras Verdes, and this village is located right at the pass where the Arroyo La Tana and the Piedras Verdes are easiest to connect. A 200 room, room block, a small room block here. There's a ball court, there's an oven or two, and it's a big site. And are big sites small sites that are big, or are they like Pakime that are smaller? And it's pretty much, kind of splits the difference, but it's really kind of a small site. And it looks to us that there were a lot of communities out here, and some of them were partly abandoned, which may account for, in the 1300s, why Pakime grew so large that it sucked in population from outlying areas. So we got different kinds of sites and allowed us, as much as possible, with these limited amount of work, to get an idea about to contrast special sites from big sites and these small sites and to see uh, how they're all related. The second excavation phase was we started working near Pakime. Here is Casas Grandes right here. Here's that beautiful floodplain. And here's a site that miraculously um, uh, was not destroyed by land leveling and agriculture. On the other hand, one day when we were living out in the Mormon colonies excavating that site 204, I went into town to do grocery shopping and the, the county front end loader was digging into it for fill. <laughs> to fill a ditch. Fortunately, we got it stopped. There was an archaeologist. So, But it survived, and it is an amazing site. 
And also, uh, the second year we were at that site, I was done excavating my area. It was backfilled. I was bored. I was digging soil profiles. <laughs> and I had looked at Google at one point and thought, gee, there's something really weird down here. So I said, the heck with it. I just walked down there. And there's even a bigger site. So there's another one that's been looted and had other problems. But there are these two sites that have, even though this thing has been occupied for hundreds and hundreds of years, this is the center of of Spanish, Mexican, and, and modern Mexican populations. Um, these two sites, had, right within two kilometers of Casas Grandes, have been uh, in reasonable uh, condition. And we spent a couple, we spent a couple of years working at 315. I'm not doing any more field work, uh, but Mike Whalen is continuing, uh, and he did uh, 565. Uh, season and he's going to probably do one more uh, uh, project. Neat stuff. And so we not only had the sites at the far edge of the Pakime, the central core area, but two sites were really close. And uh, the, the 315 just had all kinds of goodies. Not, not Pakime level goodies, but it had more goodies than anywhere else, suggesting that core area. Maybe we shouldn't just think of Pakime as a center, but we ought to think of this area around Pakime as being particularly important in the core of whatever was happening. At the, during the medio time period. So there are some excavations, uh, neat stuff. You can see all the looted, these are all looting holes. But uh, you know, as long as you don't use machinery, you can get sense of, of stuff. There's not many, most of the pots are gone, burials have been looted because people want to sell the pottery. Uh, but the walls are there, you can get an idea of the floor. And so I, having worked in Membrace before Pakime, I don't know what an unlooted site would be like. It would just be, it would be unbelievable. Except for 242 was so deep, the walls were so high, the looters go down a meter. And they went down a meter and said, where the hell's the floor? And they stopped. And so that was in good condition. But uh, this is very typical, looting holes. You can still learn a great deal <coughs> uh, by it. And the architecture is pretty nice. It's not quite as nice as Pakime, but it's better than those sort of outlying communities. And <coughs> so the work there uh, really is, is adds to our understanding of the regional character, the social and cultural landscape of Pakime. Well, let's get back to the boring stuff, shall we? <laughs> Farming. Remember, I like ethnobotany. Remember, for all the, all the neat stuff, all the four and a half million shell, all of the copper, all of the macaws, these people were farmers, and I think you can make a good argument that was the core of their economy and probably was the primary source of their wealth that they were able to build this great community on farming. And so we need to look at farming. And uh, that's where I've spent a good deal of time. Here is a composite map. There's Papi, Pakime looking at farming. I'm working on that right now, trying to make some sense out of the lowland farming. It's hard to do because literally from uh, 1500s on, there's been continual farming. It's really hard. But clearly, the floodplains are productive. They continue to be productive. It's an agricultural center. But there's also a lot of upland farming, these terraces, which are locally known as trincheras. And we have those all throughout the uh, southwest, northwest. And there are a lot of them. And we've, we've recorded about 180 of them and uh, done a few studies. This is a, a soil scientist from Iowa State and his late wife, who's an agronomist, and uh, an archaeologist from Juarez. And this is, these are those rock terraces where they would have farmed. And John is doing uh, technical studies of the soil. And if you get water to these things, they're really productive. You, they're upland. You think, oh, what a terrible place to do agriculture. And he says, he, he says, no, if you uh, get water to those, the, they're very productive soils. And this is the guy that's the coach for the Iowa State soil uh, team. There are actually these teams that compete against, about soil classification. And so he knows his stuff. And here you can see one of the small systems. They form various ways. But you can see there's, there, there's a system of these things, of these rock walls. But interestingly enough, it isn't just small farms. But out of the 186, six of them are very special. They're huge. So you have most of them that are this size, and then you have six of them that are gigantic. And they tend to be near special sites and away from population. So here's that Cerro Moctezuma again. El Pueblito's right here. And this whole like little topographic amphitheater is filled with rock terraces. And in fact, there is an oven right by that tree. And we think that this is evidence of cheese fields or cacique fields. That they're known from the Pueblo world and many other places in the world where leaders have fields. And 
commoners have to come in and work those fields, and the, and the yields go to the chief to be used however he wants. And so we'd expect to find them, but I think this is the first archaeological evidence of chief's fields. And so the political ecology, the political economy, was not just in the fancy artifacts, but even in the basic production of these fields, suggesting there was sent leaders had some control over some of the production, and let's not forget the ovens, in the preparation for these things. So the politics and the religious activities permeate all aspects of Pakime. And we need to look at everything and not just, we need to look at this stuff, uh, and not just uh, the fancy artifacts which catch our attention. Oh, pottery. I mean, how can, I, I'm one of the few Southwestern archaeologists who don't care about pottery. I'm married to a person. How many Southwestern pottery people? We have five of them probably in this room. Um, <laughs> That's Ramos polychrome, which is the polychrome which is typical. There are other kinds, and this is probably the most important marker of being involved in whatever the Pakime system, the Pakime polity, the Pakime culture, the Pakime religion was. And uh, uh, Christine Van Poole has looked at uh, images and tried to read some of these images and, and give a story about uh, the meaning of these pots. They were very, very important, and they're pretty cool. Um, and also, they give us some chronology. My colleague, Mike Whalen, does pottery, and he thinks he's now going to be able to divide Pakime up uh, the time period, this medio time period. It would be, you know, it was, uh, it was hundreds of years that we couldn't divide it up well. I mean, it would be like 1776 and 1976. That would be American history, and so much happened. But at least we now divide it, we think, into two. And it looks like Pakime really starts going great guns at 1300. And before that, there was Pakime and other communities and everything, but the, the stuff you see, the, the monumental, I hate to use that word, really, the, the, the big public architecture and all these other things that make Pakime so exciting, probably is post-1300 lasts. We don't know when it ends. The endings and beginnings are really hard to tell archaeologically. But let's say the late 1400s, and when the Spanish come in, there's nothing like Pakime. It's abandoned, and they say, well, there are hunters and gatherers, and there are people in Rancheria. There's nobody living in a Pueblo. And so we don't know what happened to them. Peso had this wonderful story that it was sacked. I think he's wrong about that. I think it just decayed. These kinds of societies where you have groups fighting for an unstable political structure and often using religious ideology and symbols uh, are often very unstable. Remember Chaco Canyon and such didn't last that long. And they had the same fate. But that awaits uh, more research. So we don't know exactly what happened. And it's very different, again, from the Sonoran Desert and the ancestral Pueblo area where you have continuity from modern groups going back into prehistory. And we simply have no clue who the descendants, what groups are the descendants of Pakime. Maybe DNA work at some point, we'll figure that out. But right now, take your choice. Nobody claims it. We don't know. It's a very different contextual interpretive situation than in the rest of the Southwest Northwest. That's enough for Potter, I think. Okay. <laughs> so. You're lucky you got a slide, come on. Um, <clears throat> I, I would have shown you all 17 chili seeds I found, but <laughs> I, I thought you guys aren't worthy, huh? Okay, what if we, I just some simple things. Uh, this is a major region, and it's not recognized often as such because it's in that, 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 be, that between area, between the intensively studied Southwest and the intensively studied Mesoamerica, where, uh, so little work is done. And when projects go and people leave, they aren't continuing. One of the things that Mike and I have tried to do, and it's very hard, is to get some continuity. And we're hoping Todd Peitzel and Mike Searcy uh, at BYU, we're hoping they, they're doing a project and will continue this so we get ongoing research. It's hard to do for a variety of reasons. Mexico is actually very easy to work with. They're, they're very good. Uh, but there are a variety of reasons. There's money north of the border, and there's not money south of the border, among other things. But it's a major region. And I, I'm hoping you can see that it is as interesting as Chaco or Classico, Comer, those sorts of things. We just don't know nearly as much about it. It's a distinct cultural tradition. Yes, it's a part of the Pueblo world, I think that. But that architecture, the pottery, it's its own tradition. It has to be understood within its own history. It interacted with the Hohokam, probably interacted with the ancestral Pueblo, not in the way Steve Lexon thinks. Uh, but it was a... Uh, uh, a tradition that needs to be understood within its own terms, and history, an interesting history, needs to be un understood within its own terms. It's a large site, and not as large, I think, as the Peso thought, but a small polity. We think it really had its control 
was within a very one walking dis one day's walking distance largely, but its influence spread widely. Mostly post 1300, they basically thought it was about 11, uh, 1160, and nobody grew, uh, that was some of the earliest radiocarbon dates. And nobody ever has agreed with that particularly, but we think it's uh, we can make a strong argument it's post 1300. There's a lot of Mesoamerican symbols and goods, and the peso thought it was a trading center. And our argument is it's probably local groups, I think three of them, competing for power and prestige in an area. And one way to do that is to use symbols from powerful things elsewhere. And so it's mostly a local phenomenon. And Mesoamerica is important. You can't understand Pakime without Mesoamerica, uh, but that it you have to understand the local situation. Again, not everybody agrees with us on that. We don't know how it ended, along a lot of other things. There's so much work to be done. I think Mike Whaling's next project is try to understand the end. One of the areas that, that last site, 565, um, has really crappy architecture, and we think it may have been at the end. So crappy that uh, when I was running the excavation, the test excavation, I, I went through so many adobe walls, it was pathetic, it was embarrassing. <laughs> So there's a lot to know the end. We want to know what the end is. Why did it end? And it might be interesting because various people like Jared Diamond use the Southwest as an example of societies in marginal environments and how environments can conspire against groups to cause them to collapse. Now, a lot of people disagree with that, but that's very, very common. I actually am a little more sympathetic than most archaeologists, but that's an argument that's out there in the public. Pakimea is particularly interesting because if Mike and I are correct, and Pakimea is one of the premier nice spots in the Southwest, how does that relate to places, the collapse of places that are a little more marginal? Well, it's going to take a whole lot more work. And, it, and, and so there are lots of historical questions that need to be answered about Pakimea. How it was organized, how it ended, how it began, but it also helps us put the un understanding uh, the entire Southwest and Northwest, because they are not completely isolated. Okay, some real simple lessons. Uh, interconnectedness of the borderlands. It's not, you can't, if you look at a number of books, and especially in the past, archaeology of the Southwest, it ended at the border. That's untenable. They're connected. Stuff in Chihuahua is neat, but stuff in Sonora just south of here, like La Plata, is unbelievable. Or Trinchetta. Has anybody been to Trinchetta's site? Or La Playa? Those are unbelievably interesting, and they really add to our understanding. So the borderlands are artificial, but they're workable. Mexico is actually pretty easy to, to work in. Uh, and there's that interconnectedness, and we need to work at building those connections to help understand both areas. And it's good because Mexican archaeologists are trained differently from North American archaeologists, and there's that synergy that that way of communicating and people uh, questioning basic assumptions that you don't question often in how you're trained. The second one is just I just talked about. Okay, the third is obviously the value of private organizations. Um, the Amaranth uh, was able to do one of the premier projects, Archaeology Southwest. I keep wanting to say Center for Dead Sorry. I'm sorry, Bill. <laughs> These, there's an incredible amount of money in archaeology in the, in, in the Southwest. Incredible amount of money. I asked somebody how much is in Arizona, and it was staggering each year. But it's not evenly spread. That money can do certain things, but it can't do other things that are critical. And what a variety of these uh, private foundations and organizations can do is fill in the cracks. They don't have the money that a lot of these large contracts do, but they can use the money wisely to answer questions and do things that couldn't be done otherwise. So for example, my wife and I met at the Membrace, the Membrace Foundation. We were working in an area where there's no big building going on. There was uh, no construction, and so there wasn't any research in the Membrace, even though that pottery is amazing and interesting, and the Membrace is one of the first aggregated areas of aggregated Pueblo. But it was a private foundation that was able to do the archaeological research. And so we have representatives of, of two foundations, and you are involved, and um, I don't get paid for this endorsement. Uh, they're really important because despite the amount of money, they can do things and they can do very efficient things that other organizations can't do. And if Paki May and the Ameren research from 1969, to, uh, from 1959 to 1961, and then uh, the publication in 1974 doesn't convince you, nothing more can be said. All right. Oh, yeah. Chile was well worthwhile. Thank you.